Excellent. Do you need a minute before we... No, I'm mad now. Let's go. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Wait, should we welcome people to the chef? Oh, shoot, right. Hi, welcome to the ChefCast. Hi, welcome to the All Business ChefCast. It's very important that we say that we are starting the third week of Advent. Right. Like Advent 3 is coming up, not Advent 2 or mm -hmm. Advent 4. Yeah, not Advent 4. We are not moving into Advent 4. Uh, this is, uh, there are four Sundays in Advent. This is the third one. The fourth Sunday is Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I shouldn't have to say that, but apparently I do. Yeah, here we are. Isaiah 61, you said? Yep. Right, let me guess. It starts on verse 1 uh, and goes to verse, what, like 3? They have it split up 1 to 4, 8 to 11. So my proposition is one we do Isaiah 61. Yeah, that's all of it. Okay, great. Yep. The spirit of the Lord, sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Allians will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work in your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes his seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. So Isaiah is a book that we go to quite a bit during the season of Advent. Uh, and yep. It has a lot of prophecies that deal with the coming of Christ. And even looking at this, you see a very different um, picture of end times of like the end of life because there's a lot of promise that's being given here that wasn't necessarily what was practiced as much during mm. the time that this is written the idea that there would be that oil of gladness instead of mourning the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit that at the time of a person's death there would be celebration wasn't necessarily the practice of that time so the prophecies that are in Isaiah are really pointing to the fulfillment of everything through Christ. And it's interesting to see it in a time that wasn't necessarily as prevalent. It's interesting because you can see how the people of Israel would be expecting somebody to do this in a material fashion. Mm -hmm. That they would be saying, boy, we sure want somebody to rebuild our cities and, and to restore the places long devastated. But there's a problem with that, which is that that only lasts so far. Right. That does not last forever. Like, and a hundred years is a long time or whatever, but it's not forever. Everybody assumes that everything's going to last forever, but it really doesn't. No, no. Like, like things come and go remarkably quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about the fact that we are now entering into 2024 very soon, mm -hmm. and, and there was a time within living memory for people where there was the the British Empire, like it actually existed. And everybody was like, well, that's just like the most important and long lasting and stable empire, the empire on which the sun never sets. It's never gonna stop, never gonna end. There's no need to do anything else ever because the British Empire is fine. It's always been there, it's always going to be there. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, poof, gone. Right. And every empire assumes they're at the end of history. They've all been wrong so far. This idea to just build uh, 
rebuild ancient ruins and so on. Yeah, but for how long? Right. Well, yeah, and I mean, what we see here is a prophecy of really eternal rebuilding, right? Right, and like that's the thing is like building's not made with human hands, you yeah. know. But this idea that you can seek a god who will rebuild your house in a world where houses fall apart every day, yeah. like I guess, but so what? Mm -hmm. I suppose, which is uh, not too dismissive, but it's dismissive enough. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean, it's the same thing like why rebuild something now that's going to be destroyed in the future like in the not so near or not so far future right there's a really yeah you you see that coming out in the gospels a lot where mm -hmm. they're awaiting somebody who will just fix it right well i mean you see it like the uh the living water right mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. where where is this water that will make it so i never thirst yeah so not a hall water, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, like I understand why they cut those verses in the middle, but like, what's the problem leaving them in? Well, exactly, right? Like it doesn't add, it doesn't detract. Why not have a more full reading? It's nice that this stuff does come up in other places. Mm -hmm. I, I think you'll find that moving ahead away from like matters political, I suppose, like in terms of like questions of real estate and questions of who's in charge of what patch of ground for what mm -hmm. period of time. Moving beyond that is really helpful. Uh, and you can see God pointing Israel to that all the way throughout the Old Testament, like trying mm -hmm. to guide them gently in that direction to say yeah. to them, hey guys, just so you know, we're dealing with bigger things than just that. Right. Um, and like they frequently fail on that as the rest of us do. Mm -hmm. Like when we get bent out of shape and saying, Dear Lord, please help my football team win or whatever the heck. And then yeah. we're like devastated when he doesn't. Maybe that's not the biggest concern. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No. Well, and in that um, portion that otherwise would have been cut was the discussion of possessing a double portion to have, excuse me, to have that double portion of the inheritance, which isn't something we hear about too often. Like, I mean, we think of Elijah and Elisha, right? Where right, I, a double portion. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for me, it was nice to see it in another place other than just that. Yeah, right? absolutely. Know that this is something that does occur in other places. Now, you know what's going to be coming up in the gospel reading. Well, I already you? peaked. So. Yeah, you know, know what's going to be coming up. Uh, so Well, and I would know even without this reading because it's the third Sunday of Advent. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, we, we don't focus too much on, um, like, the candles and the and what they mean. No. But the third Sunday the is Sunday. the Sunday of joy. So without even knowing, can you guess what the epistle reading is? Uh, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Yep. So it is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God, in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Can you read just the next word? Brothers. Does it say brothers and sisters or just brothers? Brothers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, every once in a while, they, they try to pull the fast one and say brothers and sisters or whatever. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, you know, if it said that, it would say it. Yeah. That's well, I all. mean, of course, when we're reading the letters, you need to recognize that it's being written essentially to the leader of the church, which... Uh, correct. ...is a brother. Yes. Inevitably. Yeah. Um, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Um, that's real simple, right? Well, and the thing about passages like this is that you really need to look at the entirety, right? Like, cause you can say things like, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies. And you could stop there and you can twist that to mean whatever you want it to mean, but it really needs to be held in with the next part that says, test everything, hold fast. What is good? You need to recognize what the scriptures say, what actually is good 
according to what God says, not just your own understanding. Testing everything is not that hard. You think it is, but it's not. It's mm -hmm. like a... It's like any other little litmus paper that you dip yeah. in and you see if it turns pink or blue or whatever. It's the same thing here where it's not hard to figure out what is or is not in line with Scripture. It's, it's very, very, very easy. God has not made this complicated. No. Like he hasn't presented you with an impossible task to say to you uh, that you will never know what God is thinking. Like he's not inscrutable. No. He's told you what he thinks and, and what he... His message is remarkably consistent throughout Scripture. That's the whole reason it works, is it would be very, very different if it changed its thoughts every five minutes and was very incoherent. Mm -hmm. It's quite coherent. It makes perfect sense all the yeah. way across. Um, and it makes it very easy to test what is and what is not of God. Very easy indeed. It's not like a who, who could have ever known. Mm -hmm. When we're thinking about testing everything, it's not like, you know how it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Right, of course. But what that means is everything that you have, every motivation that you have from a matter of, of godly discipline should be tested to say, mm -hmm. is this a good idea? Does this help or does it not? Right. Is this from God or, or isn't it? Because a lot of people will come up with a lot of things that they'll say yeah. are really important, like in the name of love and compassion yeah. and joy yeah. and whatever that are directly against the word of God and they'll say, yeah, but it's motivated by love. And you're like, okay, sure. Yeah. But all kinds of monstrous things are done in the name of love. What's your point? Right. Does it align with the scriptures? Well, and as we know, Satan is very easily able to twist things ever so slightly. So it seems as though it should be something like, I mean, you look in the garden, surely God didn't say that. Surely God doesn't want you to die. That's not what was said, but it's close enough that without testing it, it sounds like it could be from God. It sounds like something God could say. You also have the devil tempting Christ with words directly yeah, from Scripture. With, yeah. with him saying, throw yourself off the top of the temple, for it says in Scripture, he will command his angels to bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. That's out of Scripture. Absolutely it is. Of... Uh, and but the, does the sentiment agree with what yes, Scripture says? Yes, absolutely. Right? Um, you, and you'll find yourself in a situation where people will take Scripture and will use Scripture to justify whatever they want to do. Because mm -hmm. you can do that easily if you take five words of Scripture. Oh, it's not hard to do at all. It's not hard at all. And, and this is, I mean, plays into the itching ears motif where people will say, all right, so am I hearing the Word of God or am I hearing what I want to hear? Mm -hmm. uh, is, this, is this in keeping with the message of Christ? Or is this just what I happen to want to hear at any given moment? And it's probably what I want to hear. Yeah. Because nobody wants to be told that they're doing the wrong thing. Which is, again, um, a lot of people will make the argument like, I don't need church. I can read the Bible at home. But if you alone by yourself are reading the Bible hmm. without having like that check and balance, somebody to say, somebody to interpret essentially what it says, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. You can make the Bible agree with whatever it is that you think if it's just you and the Bible. And right? people do. And they do. All the time. Like there is a good reason why we still have church services. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in here, as the word says, what, is it, what do you have for verse 20? Verse 20, do not despise prophecies. Do not despise prophecies. Mine says do not treat prophecies with contempt. But I think mm -hmm. it gets to the same point. Mm -hmm. That you are, and like, what is prophecy? Prophecy is just uh, speaking the word of God, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not predicting the future necessarily, no. but it can be. Um, but it's, it's uh, in reality, if we are going to be in a situation where we can be joyful and can pray continually and give thanks in all circumstances, it's going to have to be if our whole spirit, soul, and body are, are sanctified at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like anything else is going to lead to you saying, yeah, but what about, what right. about, what about, what about me? What about what I want? What about my needs? What about my, but, 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 but whatever it is. And like, that's true. And that happens all the time, all yeah. the time. Uh, it's not good, but like, it's got to start with, it starts with Christ and, and then it goes from there. We love because he loved us. Right. That's like people want to get the cart before the horse and say, mm -hmm. well, we, should, we as Christians should just, just, just be loving each other. Just be loving people. We should yeah. just be a more loving people. Yep. Yeah. But we love but because he loved us. Right. And how does he love us? Greater love has no man than this than he laid down his life for his friends. Like mm -hmm. that's how it goes. 
it goes like that. That's what we mean by when we say scripture interprets scripture. Yeah. Is we say, if we want to be loving, then we are going to have to be people who love each other and forgive each other, who understand that one another are sinners and who are quick to forgive mm -hmm. as Christ forgave us. That's how you love people. You don't love people by saying to them, do whatever you want. Right. That's not how Christ loved us. No. Not at all. And not by saying just do better without having a specific example of what better is. No, not in yeah. the slightest. Like, that's not what it is. But you end up in these sorts of abuses of scripture very easily if somebody says, just love people. Mm -hmm. Like, all that God wants you to do is love people. Yes, but how? Yeah. What does that look like? And it looks like God himself sanctifying you through and through and keeping your whole spirit, soul, and body blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Like, that's how that works. Yeah. Not through some sort of backwards cockamamie thing where you just say all you need is love. Da, 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 da. Because that could mean anything. Yep. And it does mean anything. Everybody, Absolutely. Everybody assumes that they're a perfectly loving person. Mm -hmm. I very rarely run into somebody who says, oh, I'm the worst. Man, I don't like anybody. Woof. They're a real hard case me. Like people assume that they are on the right side of love, peace, joy, compassion, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And just everybody else is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, rolling on to the gospel reading? Yep. What is that? So it is John 1, and this is the one case for our one time where I'll make the case for the split verse. Oh verses my gosh. 6 through 8, and then 19 through 28. Okay. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that, all, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. 19. And it was 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him to ask who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. Then they asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some, I, I keep going, yeah, yeah. Some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one whom you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. See, now this passage is one that really does confuse me because Jesus says that John is Elijah. Yeah. And John says that he is not. Yeah. I think, based on nothing whatsoever, that John's wrong about his own role. Hmm. Because I know Christ isn't. Right. I know Christ is correct. I know there's a discussion about Elijah's return, the spirit of Elijah returning. Um, and I think that John is focused on Christ and is incorrect about himself. Edgy take. Yeah. But the, I, I don't see how they could both be correct. Right. And like, like I was wondering if it was maybe just from a place of humility to say that he couldn't, he couldn't be alive like, because like, he wasn't. I, I think it makes sense for John to say that he is not a reincarnation of Elijah right. because he isn't. Like right. Elijah is not reincarnated. And Elijah, no, Elijah is Elijah. And Elijah does return. Yeah. The Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, absolutely. So he's there. He's present. Yeah. But and he's there as Elijah. He's not there as John the Baptist. Correct. But I do think it's entirely possible that John has misconstrued his own role. Like, I think John is perfectly correct in saying that he is not a reincarnation of Elijah, nor is he, uh, like, the final prophet, nor is, or, or like, uh, no, like, the return of... of what is the prophet? What a great question. Here we are. We're, I can your, look in my... Say? It's verse 25, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't say anything. 21. Oh, 21? Yeah. Many apparently thought Jesus was the new Moses. Okay. Also, the prophet is probably Moses. Sure. Okay, so the thought was that he was either Elijah or Moses or anything like that. Yeah. But he's not. No. Now, he's not... Which is funny, because those are the two guys that show up in Transfiguration. Yeah. How interesting. So... When they're looking for the return of 
Elijah and Moses, those guys do come back to discuss with Christ what's happening up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They do return. Mm -hmm. But they're not here. No. John the Baptist is not the reincarnation of Elijah, which is what they want him to be. They want him to be like, this is now the end times. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Elijah has returned. We're done with this now. Now we get Jerusalem back for us. The Romans go. The Greeks go. The Abyssinians go. Everybody goes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just us now because Elijah has returned. But that's not the role of Elijah to be like the the judge of Israel in the sense of like the judges from the Old Testament, mm. the role of Elijah is to point to Christ, right? right? So when it says, is Elijah going to come back? You have certainly John embodying that spirit yeah. here, like by saying, uh, make straight the way of the Lord, make his pastor, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then you also have uh, Elijah, 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 like on the mountain being present at the Mount of Transfiguration, thus fulfilling that prophecy yeah. that said Elijah is going to come back before the Messiah does the Messiah's work. He totally does. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, this is very Christmas Day reading. Well, uh, and I was very surprised when I saw it first because I just saw the John 1 and yeah. I was like, oh, that's not right. But of course it does have the John the Baptist, which... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, this is this is great because this is very much John the Baptist pointing to Christ and not pointing to himself. Mm -hmm. um, and answering questions about his identity in a way that even Christ answers questions about his own identity. Yeah, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that I am, right? Uh, because people are looking for... They're looking for a prophet. They're not looking for a manifestation of God. Like, not really... Uh, because the thing about a prophet is you can, if you want to, manipulate prophets, or at least try to. Well, I mean, how many times do we hear about false prophets throughout the scriptures? False prophets Beware of false prophets. And then real, fall, real prophets being killed as they were, yeah. oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long I have sought to gather you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you were not willing. Uh, also, we can't forget that John the Baptist himself is murdered. Beheaded. Beheaded for speaking truth to power, yep. as they say. Uh, for outing somebody's sexual immorality, he's murdered for it. That yeah. is still a very real possibility for doing the exact same thing. Even the people that want Elijah to come back are ill-suited to deal with Elijah's return. Mm -hmm. You know, even yeah. people who are like, boy, it would sure would be nice to have Elijah come back. And then you have somebody manifesting the words of Elijah, and they say, well, we better get rid of this guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like as quickly as possible. He's not going to say to us, steer the course, you're doing super, right? He's yeah. going to say... In many ways, maybe you haven't done things the right way. Yeah. And that's like John's whole job when he says he must increase and I must decrease is that I, all I can do is point you to the one who forgives sins. Mm -hmm. And I can do that by highlighting your sins. But if you want your sins forgiven, you're going to have to go and see him. That's why I'm not worthy to even stoop down and untie his shoes, right? Like he's a big deal because he actually forgives sins. Yeah. All that I can do or you could do or anybody else can do apart from God is to tell people that, that they haven't done the right thing. Right. But any, any attempt that we could have to say to people, no, you've actually done the right thing, would be just to totally excuse That's what they've done. That's false prophecy. Of course it's false prophecy. It's yeah. big time false prophecy to try and yeah. bolster somebody up by telling them, you've done it all right. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Which, of course, is like even if you look at the liturgy, which I love to point out, is that we start off by saying... Oh, yeah. I am a terrible, wretched human being. And then the point where the pastor says, in the stead of Christ, and acting by his as command. Christ, yeah. I forgive your sins. You're not forgiving on your own. Nope. It's through Christ. Mm -hmm. And I, again, that's the same thing we see here. John is saying, here are your sins. Go to the one who can forgive. Right. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Yeah. Which is great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because all, like any prophet could only ever point out your sinfulness, which they do yeah. frequently. Well, I mean, look at Jonah, right? Like mm. he's primo example where he does a terrible job, but still points out sins mm -hmm. and still pushes Nineveh towards redemption where Nin they recognize their sins and repent. They are afflicted by it right away. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's what you see in a prophet, as you say, is they point out your sins and then you seek out forgiveness from God. Period. End of story, right? Yeah. 
That's it's interesting to have that as the joy reading, but then again, like but that the, that is what joy is. Sure, so. absolutely. If, if somebody says to you, "There is a problem, but here is how your problem can be solved," there's great rejoicing. That's a way better thing mm -hmm. to hear than somebody who says there are no problems while everything's falling apart and dissolving. Right. Like, why do I feel so bad then if I have no problems? Yes, exactly. And why is says, everything well, so bad if there's no problems? Just don't worry about it. Yep. That's not helpful. But there's there's great rejoicing while John is pointing out Christ mm -hmm. for people who in darkness dwelt. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing to have yep. uh, that pointed out to you as something that can actually solve the problems, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, anything further? No. Okay, great. It's quite joyful. Uh, then uh, let's close the prayer, and then we can move on with everything. Are you going day. to pray without ceasing? Uh, we'll be here for a while then. <laughs> Gracious Lord, we thank you for sending us uh, John the Baptist to proclaim the way to Christ, to say, I must decrease, but he must increase. And in doing so, pointing out where salvation, forgiveness, grace, and like true joy comes from, which is from Christ. Uh, keep us steadfast in his kingdom, both here on earth and in the life to come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us on our Shepcast, and we'll catch you next time. We'll see you then.